Today on Brief History, we reflect on an English king who would come to power during one of the bloodiest conflicts to ever burden England. Growing up in tumultuous and chaotic times, he would be destined to play a role in the conflicts that plagued the kingdom. His path to kingship would be wrought with turmoil, betrayal, faction, and bloodshed on a most devastating level. Join me as I take a brief look at Edward of Rouen, remembered today as Edward IV of England. Edward was born on April 28, 1442, in Rouen, Normandy. He was the son of Richard, Duke of York, also known as Richard Plantagenet, and his mother was Cecily Neville, also known as Proud Sis. Edward's legitimacy would eventually be questioned, although there is not much evidence to suggest that Edward was illegitimate, and the legitimacy question would not become a factor until later in Edward's life, which will be discussed later in Edward's story. Edward was the third child of 12 children between his parents, although his elder brother would die young and thus make Edward the eldest surviving son and heir to his father's inheritance. Edward had three younger brothers, Edmund, George, and Richard, two of which will be discussed in much more detail later in Edward's story. At the age of three, Edward was designated as the Earl of March, and from the age of seven, he was educated in courtesy, writing, and martial arts at Ludlow Castle, part of the Mortimer Estates. The Mortimers were the previous Earls of March, prior to Edward's father and himself taking on that title. The connection between the Mortimers and Edward will also be discussed later in his story. Edward's life began during tumultuous times, and his adolescence would see much conflict as England and France were embattled in a long-standing war known as the Hundred Years' War, which had already been raging for over a century. The well-known and much-loved King Henry V of England had won great victories in France, and he and his heirs had been designated as the heirs to the French throne after his successes on the continent. However, Henry V died unexpectedly and at a young age, and his infant son, Henry VI of England, inherited not only his English throne, but his French claims as well. Henry VI had taken over the reins of government, in theory, at 16 years of age in 1337, a few years prior to Edward's birth. However, the reality is that Henry was an ineffectual leader and did not have the desire or capacity to handle the issues that were at hand. Henry VI is reflected on today as an incredibly pious, yet simple and foolish king who heeded poor advice from favorites in his household. This poor leadership would have devastating effects in England and in English-controlled France. By the time Edward was born, the English already had their backs against the wall with regards to their French territories, which at the time included Calais, Normandy, parts of Maine, and Gascony in the southwest. Much territory had been held by the English prior to that, including Paris and the French coronation city of Reims, but had been lost. This situation is what prompted Edward's father to travel to Normandy. He had been sent there after being designated as Henry VI Lieutenant in Normandy in 1336 and was again reappointed as Lieutenant in 1440. He had done well establishing order and justice there. However, Henry VI and his advisors made poor decisions in relation to the French interests, and Edward's father was eventually replaced by a man named Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset. This would be the basis for a long feud between Richard's father and the Beauforts, and this feud, along with the Beauforts' connection to the English monarchy, will be discussed shortly. Poor decisions and treaties that benefited the English position very little, if at all, eventually led to the complete collapse of the English presence on the continent, culminating in an English military loss in the final battle of the Hundred Years' War at Castillon, led by John Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, who was killed during the battle. John Talbot will come up again briefly in Edward's story as well. After the loss of the French territories, and with the perception that government and justice in England was being corrupted by Henry VI's favorites, brought on by Henry's ineffectual and simple rule, much opposition began to arise in regards to the weak king. 
At the forefront of the opposition was Edward's father, who after 1447 was the closest living relative to Henry VI. The stage was being set for one of the worst civil conflicts England had ever seen, and although Edward was only a boy at the time, he would play a major role in these conflicts in the years to come. Before understanding Edward's early role in the battles that were to take place between his father and Henry VI, it is important to understand the background to Henry VI's kingship, Edward's father's potential claim to the throne of England, which would eventually be inherited by Edward himself, and the important people that played a part in the struggles. To start, one must go back to King Edward III of England's reign. Edward III had four sons that require discussion. They are Edward of Woodstock, known today as the Black Prince, Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and Edmund of Langley, Duke of York. Edward of Woodstock died before Edward III did, and therefore the throne passed to his son, Richard, who became Richard II of England. Richard was unpopular and tyrannical, and was usurped by his first cousin, Henry of Lancaster, also known as Henry Bolingbroke, who would become Henry IV of England. Henry was the father of the famous Henry V discussed previously, and the grandfather to the current King Henry VI. However, Henry IV was the son of John of Gaunt, who was the third surviving son of Edward III. John of Gaunt's elder brother, Lionel of Antwerp's lineage, were alive and well, and technically had a better claim to the throne. This is where the Mortimers, the Earls of March discussed previously, come into play. At the time of Henry IV's usurpation and Henry V's subsequent reign, the Mortimers were young and had little support, and thus were not in a position to assert their claims to the throne. However, the weak King Henry VI was a different story. But the man that would have been in a position to challenge Henry VI's kingship, the at the time current Earl of March Edmund Mortimer, died without children early in Henry VI's reign before many of the major problems arose. Therefore, Edmund Mortimer's inheritance and claim to the throne passed to his nephew, the son of his sister, Anne. This, of course, was Edward's father, Richard, Duke of York. Edmund Mortimer's sister, Anne, had married a man named Richard of Conisborough, son of Edmund of Langley, Duke of York. This thus merged the lineage of Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, with the lineage of Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence. So, although the future battles that we will discuss will be between Henry VI's House of Lancaster and Edward's House of York, Edward and his father's claim ultimately is derived from his grandmother Anne Mortimer and her bloodline connection to Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence. It is important to, at this point, notate that John of Gaunt had illegitimate children known as the Beauforts that were legitimized during King Richard II's reign. Although many Beauforts of different generations were heavily involved in Henry VI's reign, one of which being the Edmund Beaufort discussed previously, only a few will be touched on briefly throughout Edward's story. Lastly, it is also important to notate that Henry VI's mother, Catherine of Valois, married and had children with a Welshman named Owen Tudor. The Tudor children and their lineages will become important during and after Edward's life and will be discussed as well. As touched on previously, Edward's father was the closest living male relative to Henry VI after 1447, but he was shown little favor by Henry or his inner circle. Thus, unsurprisingly, conflict arose. Edward's father opposed King Henry VI's close favorites, specifically the Edmund Beaufort who had replaced him in Normandy before Normandy was lost. In that time, if one was not inclined to attempt to usurp the throne from the current king, it was unwise to criticize him or his queen, as this could leave one open to the charge of treason. Thus, going after the king's inner circle or favorites would become a common theme that we will soon see. After being replaced in Normandy, Edward's father had been sent to Ireland as a lieutenant to get him out of the way, but returned to England without royal permission in order to clear his name and address the issues with Henry VI's favorites. Just prior to this, the Commons in Parliament had already impeached some of Henry's favorites of treason, and additionally, an uprising had killed many of Henry's favorites as well. Initially, Henry and his advisors had granted clemency to many of those who rebelled against his rule, 
However, between 1450 and 1453, Henry VI began to punish anyone involved in rebellion, and whether through his own decision-making or through advising of his favorites, began to show a good deal of royal strength. Edward's father actually had raised a force and was confronted by Henry's army at Darford Heath, to which Edward's father was forced to submit and was humiliated, essentially going into political exile. But in 1453, major events took place. The Earl of Warwick, Richard Neville, entered into a land dispute with Edmund Beaufort, Edward's father's rival. Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, was the son of the Earl of Salisbury, also named Richard Neville, who was a wealthy and powerful peer of the realm, who had actually supported Henry against Edward's father at Dartford. It is believed that Henry intended on dealing with this matter himself, but on his way into the area, he was stricken by a bout of madness, which caused him to lose any ability to speak, listen, comprehend, or rule effectively. Many believe that this was brought on by the news of the English loss at the Battle of Castillon discussed previously, which took place around this time. Whatever the case, this bout of madness gave Edward's father the chance to return to the fray and greatly bettered his political position after his embarrassment at Dartford. He set out to confront his rival Edmund Beaufort, who was eventually locked in the tower. Edward's father continued to gain power and was eventually made protector of England due to Henry's incapacity as king, and he was able to exert his power to benefit the Nevilles, who became his allies against Henry and Henry's favorites. Edward during this time, 10 years old in 1452, mostly stayed out of the limelight, although men in the Welsh marches were allegedly raised in his name to support his father after his embarrassment at Dartford, and Edward is also said to have received a letter from his father in 1454 after his father had became protector, scolding him for potentially raising an army. Although young men were definitely expected to grow up faster in that time, this letter may be a propaganda letter intended to show that his father was acting impartially as a protector by rebuking his own son. Henry VI was said to have recovered, at least in part, from his bout of madness by January 1455, and immediately Edward's father was removed from his protectorate, and Edmund Beaufort was removed from the tower. But Edward's father would not retreat into obscurity, and he and his newfound Neville quasi-allies were set on enforcing their wills. They raised an army, with the 13-year-old Edward now being included in these forces. They confronted Henry and his forces in a short battle at St. Albans, where Edmund Beaufort was killed, Henry VI was captured, and Edward's father and the Nevilles were victorious. This battle, known as the First Battle of St. Albans, marks the beginning of one of the bloodiest English conflicts to ever take place on English soil. It is known today as the Wars of the Roses, named for the White Rose Heraldic Badge of Edward's House of York and the Red Rose Heraldic Badge of Henry VI's House of Lancaster. The First Battle of St. Albans was small, with little losses, but as we will soon see, future battles of the Wars of the Roses will yield far greater losses. Edward's father and the Nevilles took Henry VI, who suffered yet another bout of madness, back to London, and Edward's father was eventually restored to his protectorate yet again. Edward returned to Ludlow to continue his education. However, the battles between the Lancastrians and Yorkists were far from over. Edward's father was eventually removed from his protectorate again, and Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, arose as a major player in this new war. Margaret took up her husband Henry VI and her son, Prince Edward of Westminster's cause, and was abjectly opposed to Edward's father and his Neville allies. She was able to convince Henry to withdraw to his Lancastrian estates, and the government of England all but ceased for the next four years. Word began to circulate that Edward's father wished to take the throne, and around this time, Queen Margaret summoned a great council to where she indicted Edward, his father, and the Nevilles for treason. By this time, around 1459 to 1460, Edward was around 17 years old, and he and his younger brother Edmund were beginning to seriously be considered in their father's military preparations. Forces were raised, but the elder Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, was intercepted by Queen Margaret's larger forces on his way to meet up with Edward and his father. Although outnumbered, Salisbury was able to defeat Queen Margaret's forces at the Battle of Bloor Heath in September 1459. He continued to meet up with Edward, Edward's father, and his own son, the younger Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. 
Henry VI and his allies then raised a substantial army and rode to confront this group, to which they found them at Ludford. Henry VI was instructed to sit on a horse in armor with his banner displayed, and this caused many men in Edward's father's and the Neville's camp to begin to defect. Due to this, Edward, his father, and their Neville allies dispersed in the night and fled abroad. Edward's father and his younger brother Edmund fled to Ireland, while Edward himself and the Nevilles fled to Calais. Queen Margaret proceeded with parliamentary attainder against Edward, his father, and the Nevilles, which would see all of them and their heirs losing their offices and lands. However, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, held great naval power, and thus the two exiled groups were able to communicate with each other freely. Soon a plan had been formulated to return to England with the intention of going after Henry VI's close favorites. Edward was now 18 and ready to step up onto the main stage to play a major role in the conflict. In June 1460, Edward and the Nevilles landed in Kent, gained support, and took London with the exception of the Tower. The elder Neville, Earl of Salisbury, remained in control of London while Edward and the younger Neville, Earl of Warwick, continued to pursue Henry VI. They made contact with him in July near Northampton. In a torrential downpour, after negotiations failed, Edward and Warwick defeated the Lancastrian forces at the Battle of Northampton, recapturing Henry, who was found in a tent. He was taken back to London, where the tower soon surrendered. Edward's father, still in Ireland, landed ten weeks after the Nevilles and Edward did. However, upon his return, he openly declared his intentions to take the throne. This was not expected by the Nevilles, who disagreed with Edward's father's decision to attempt to take the throne, but this would not change his father's mind. He submitted his claim as Richard Plantagenet, rightful heir through the lineage of Lionel of Antwerp discussed previously, and demanded an answer immediately. The Lords attempted to pass responsibility, but eventually landed on a compromise. Henry VI was to remain king for life, but upon his death, Edward's father, and his heirs would take over the throne of England. This was known as the Act of Accord, and Henry VI, isolated and feeble, agreed to the terms. Of course, Queen Margaret and many other nobility were not part of this agreement, and remained as opposition. In fact, Queen Margaret and Henry VI's son, Edward of Westminster, fled to Scotland to attempt to gain allies, and Edward was sent back to the Welsh marches to raise troops for his first independent command. It was believed that his opponent would eventually be the loyal Lancastrian, Jasper Tudor, Earl of Pembroke, half-brother of Henry VI, who was exiled at the time. However, in December 1460, terrible news reached Edward. His father, his younger brother Edmund, and the elder Neville, Earl of Salisbury, were surprised and defeated at the Battle of Wakefield, with all three being slain, either during or after the battle. With this, the Yorkist cause was now to be taken on by Edward, who, as the new Duke of York, would inherit his father's claim to the throne, and, as we will see, the Wars of the Roses were shortly to enter a most vicious and bloody phase. After receiving word of his father and brother's demise, Edward immediately set out for England from his place in the Welsh marches. However, during his trip, he received word that Jasper Tudor had landed in South Wales. Edward, knowing that he could not be caught between two forces, and that many of his men had lands in Wales that would be susceptible to Jasper Tudor's assaults, chose to confront Jasper Tudor. He and his army traveled to Mortimer's Cross, where Parhelia appeared in the sky, which is a phenomenon that makes it appear as if there are three suns in the sky. Many were taken aback by this, but Edward provided assurances that this was a good sign for his fortunes to come. In this, he would be correct, as soon Jasper Tudor's forces appeared at Mortimer's Cross. The ensuing Battle of Mortimer's Cross would be a victory for Edward, and although Jasper Tudor escaped, his father, Henry VI's stepfather, Owen Tudor, was captured and executed. Edward remained in the area, and in the meantime, the mainland Castrian force moved south towards London. Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, now controlled London and took the captive Henry VI with him as he traveled north to St. Albans to confront the Lancastrian force. The Second Battle of St. Albans, however, would be in favor of the Lancastrians this time around, 
Warwick was forced to flee, and Henry VI was left to be captured by Queen Margaret and her Lancastrian forces. Edward set out after Warwick's loss, and met up with him as he headed to London. Queen Margaret's forces, now stalled by the indecisive and feeble presence of Henry VI, was not able to capitalize on the open road to London. She and Henry and their forces eventually retreated back to their Lancastrian estates. Edward now had a perceived legal right to claim the throne, as Henry VI could be seen as an oathbreaker due to the events that took place at Wakefield, which saw Edward's father and brother killed, and the events that took place at St. Albans, where Henry was reunited with Queen Margaret and her forces. Edward marched into London, was proclaimed king, and took possession of the Kingdom of England as King Edward IV of England. He did not, however, wear the crown during his inauguration, as Henry VI was still at large, and a substantial Lancastrian army still stood in opposition to his kingship. Edward wasted no time, and immediately began preparations to confront the Lancastrians. Edward set out from London towards the north in March 1461 and met up with Warwick's forces in Yorkshire. Some of his allies, specifically the Duke of Norfolk, John Mowbray, lagged behind for whatever reason. Edward's forces encountered their Lancastrian enemies near the town of Towton, south of York. Edward would be leading his forces from the front. However, Henry VI was left at York and would not be leading his men. There was a nobleman on the Lancastrian side, however, named Henry Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, son of Edward's father's previous rival Edmund Beaufort, who was killed at the First Battle of St. Albans, as discussed previously. Henry Beaufort, now as the new Duke of Somerset, was eager to exact revenge for his father's death, and he and his younger brother, also named Edmund Beaufort, will come up again throughout Edward's story. After an early engagement at Ferry Bridge, the Battle of Towton took place on March 29, 1461, in a snowstorm, which aided the Yorkists as it blew directly into the Lancastrian faces. The Lancastrians, believed initially to be set up in a defensive position, are said to have attacked and began to rout part of the Yorkist forces. The battle raged on fairly evenly matched, however, that is, until the lagging Duke of Norfolk reached the battlefield, smashed into the Lancastrian flank with fresh men, causing the Lancastrian lines to be broken. The Lancastrians began to flee, and what was initially a fairly evenly matched battle now became a rout. There was to be no mercy for the Lancastrians, and the Yorkists aggressively pursued and cut down many, with great Lancastrian losses being incurred in the rout. Some contemporary sources claim that up to 28,000 men were killed that day, although many modern historians believe that number to be greatly exaggerated, and believe losses to be closer to 9,000. Even if that is the case, the Battle of Towton is still considered an extremely bloody battle in the Wars of the Roses. Henry VI, Queen Margaret, and their son Prince Edward of Westminster fled to Scotland, and much of the North remained in Lancastrian control. The victorious 19-year-old Edward decided to head south to his coronation, which took place on June 28, 1461. Many Lancastrians refused to join the Yorkist cause. However, there were some that did, and this included the Woodville family, who will come up shortly. Edward turned his attention to Wales, where Jasper Tudor was still active. However, Jasper Tudor was eventually forced to seek refuge in the mountains of Snowdonia. The Lancastrians wished to request aid from Henry VI's uncle, King Charles VII of France, and sent an embassy to negotiate. But Charles ended up dying before they arrived, and he was succeeded by his son, Louis XI, who was in favor of the Yorkist cause at that time. Louis, however, would become notorious for his scheming and conniving behavior, and could not be trusted by either side. The future seemed bleak for Henry VI and his allies at this time, and more of Edward's attention began to be turned towards the northern Lancastrian threat and the Scots. Queen Margaret of Anjou sailed to France and was able to raise a small French force to return to Scotland. She picked up Henry, sailed to Bamburgh, and retook some of the castles before their campaign stalled. They attempted to sail back to Scotland, but were shipwrecked and barely escaped. Henry Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, and some of the other Lancastrian leaders submitted to Edward, were received into his grace, swore oaths to him, and joined his forces. Shortly thereafter, Queen Margaret and Prince Edward of Westminster would sail back to France, 
where they would be provided a residence by her father, René of Anjou. They were to never see Henry VI again, as he remained in Scotland. However, a truce was agreed to between England and France, and Louis XI agreed not to help his cousins, Henry VI and Queen Margaret. The Scots, now isolated, negotiated with Edward as well, and agreed to abandon the Lancastrian cause, with Henry VI being sent to Bamburgh. However, Henry Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, now defected back to the Lancastrian cause and joined back with Henry VI and his remaining forces. Edward traveled to negotiate with the Scots again, but the Lancastrians continually attempted to interfere with these negotiations. Henry Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, and other allies of Henry VI were defeated at the Battle of Hedgley Moor, and then finally at Hexham, where Henry Beaufort was captured and executed while Henry VI escaped from Bywell Castle to disappear without a trace. But within a matter of time, Henry VI was caught in the forest of Clitherwood and was transferred to the Tower of London. He was not executed, as this would make his much more capable son, Edward of Westminster, the rallying point of the Lancastrian cause. Things looked to be in place for a successful future kingship for Edward, but soon turmoil would again arise in England. When Edward took the throne as a young man, he was certainly seen as fairly inexperienced in the realm of politics. However, after the death of his father, he still had a formidable ally in Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, almost 14 years his senior. Edward was a determined and brave youth who was famously renowned for his courageous and bold strategy of relentless pursuit and engagement of his enemies head on. But to many in that time, it was the military and political assistance of the seasoned and internationally respected Earl of Warwick that deserved credit for Edward attaining his crown. Thus, Warwick would eventually develop the nickname to which he is remembered by today, the Kingmaker. This is obviously in reference to his involvement in Edward's ascension as king, but also in reference to the subsequent events that would take place in the future, to which we will discuss shortly. It cannot be doubted that Warwick played a major role in Edward attaining his kingship, and also played a major role in the north after the Battle of Towton, due to the fact that after Towton, Edward largely delegated roles to leading nobles, the Nevilles being amongst the most prominent. In fact, Warwick was granted almost a free hand in the north during the years of Henry VI's exile in Scotland. Warwick had been a valuable advisor and an important ally to Edward, but some today have questioned if Warwick's influence has been exaggerated and have questioned whether Edward would have actually needed a kingmaker in order to take the throne. Edward's victory at Mortimer's Cross with his own men from the Welsh marches, mixed with Warwick's loss at the Second Battle of St. Albans, lead some to believe that, although Edward was certainly a pupil of the Nevilles during their exile in Calais, by the time the throne was taken, Edward had shown that he was a capable leader and was no longer just an understudy of the powerful Warwick. Whatever the case, it is important to note the relationship between the men, and surely Warwick felt the way that many others did, that he was a major, if not the major player in the game that led to Edward taking the crown from Henry VI. Their relationship, however, would soon take a dramatic turn as we will soon see. Edward began to show favor towards others, including his young brothers, 12-year-old George, who would be made Duke of Clarence, and the 9-year-old Richard, who would be made Duke of Gloucester. Additionally, a great deal of favor was also eventually to fall elsewhere, and in a most dramatic way. Edward was considered a tall and handsome young man, towering well over 6 feet tall and being charming in personality. Although Edward was, and is still considered today, a formidable and successful warrior, he was also said to have thoroughly enjoyed leisure and was said to have been quite complacent when war was not an absolute necessity, his motto being comfort and joy. His leisurely activity included hunting, entertainment, and allegedly a great deal of sexual promiscuity, specifically with aristocratic widows. Edward was said to have been notorious for saying or doing whatever was necessary in order to bed the women he was seeking, even allegedly going as far as offering contracts of marriage to some. One of the women who he allegedly offered this to was the daughter of John Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, who was killed at the Battle of Castillon discussed previously. His daughter Eleanor, 
and her relationship with Edward would come to the forefront after Edward's death, although today she is not remembered as Eleanor Talbot, but rather by her widowed married name, Eleanor Butler. It was another widow, however, that would take center stage in Edward's story. Her name was Elizabeth Woodville, also known as Lady Grey. She was recently widowed from her first husband, Sir John Grey, and was the daughter of Lord Rivers, Richard Woodville, a previous Lancastrian who had defected to Edward's Yorkist cause, as discussed previously. She refused to become one of Edward's mistresses, but the ever-pleasure-seeking Edward married her in secret in 1464, just prior to Henry VI's capture. It should be noted, however, that it is believed that Edward continued relations with his other mistresses, fathering illegitimate children after his marriage to Elizabeth. This marriage was scandalous, as Elizabeth's father, Richard Woodville, came from rather humble beginnings, and thus the marriage was initially kept a secret. However, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, had been negotiating a marriage with the French around this time, and eventually, Edward was forced to reveal that he was already married, which greatly embarrassed Warwick. Edward's mother, Proud Sis, was said to have been outraged, as not only did she disagree with Edward marrying a lower-born woman, but she herself was also a Neville and an aunt to the embarrassed Warwick. Although embarrassed, Warwick did not immediately rise up against Edward due to the marriage. But over time, it became clear that Edward wished to distance himself from his powerful ally and previous mentor. He began to show great favor to the Woodville family, including his wife's father, brothers, and children from her previous marriage. He also began to remove certain Nevilles from positions of power, oftentimes passing over certain Nevilles when positions arose. He was also said to have broken marriage contracts between Nevilles and other members of the nobility in favor of the Queen's family members. The Woodvilles became a faction to which they enjoyed great favor from Edward, including in the council chamber and as his close advisors. To add to this, issues began to arise on the continent, with divisions between France and Burgundy presenting opportunities to forge alliances and sow discontent between the parties. The Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, remembering the woes of the Hundred Years' War, was reluctant to ally completely with the English but he was growing old and becoming frail. His son Charles, Count of Chacolet, did not hold the same feelings that his father did, and in fact, detested Louis XI of France intensely. Count Charles was open to the idea of an English alliance, and was said to have formulated a previous close relationship with Henry Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, prior to his execution. In fact, Henry Beaufort's younger brother, Edmund Beaufort, would be sheltered by Charles along with other Lancastrians and was shown great favor. Count Charles' wife died in 1465 and Edward offered marriage to his sister Margaret, but the old Duke Philip the Good would not stand for this marriage and thus a full open alliance with Burgundy could not yet be attained. Warwick was sent to negotiate with Burgundy and France, but Warwick and Charles Count of Charolais developed great detestation for each other and nothing was accomplished. It was clear that Warwick was leaning towards a French alliance, where Edward was leaning towards the Burgundians. Queen Elizabeth's father, Richard Woodville, was now to be conducting negotiations between England and Burgundy, while Warwick remained the representative on the French side. But things soon changed when Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy died in June 1467, and with that, Count Charles now became the Duke of Burgundy, and would be known to history as Charles the Bold. A pact was formally made between England and Burgundy. The marriage of Charles the Bold and Edward's sister Margaret was announced, and Brittany was added to this alliance as well. Warwick's work in relation to a French alliance was ignored, and for all those abroad that viewed Warwick as the kingmaker, the true nature of his influence was now revealed on an international stage. Edward foolishly had created a new faction around him and scorned one of his most powerful allies, but Warwick would soon show that his nickname would be well deserved. Warwick reached out to Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence, by that time around 18 years old in 1467. George had grown into a capable, intelligent, but aggressively ambitious individual. Warwick offered his daughter, Isabel, in marriage to George, but Edward quickly vetoed this marriage. 
Word of treasonous activity began to spread in relation to Warwick, and Edward was beginning to sense that he had gone too far with Warwick and the Neville faction. Warwick was allowed to deny the allegations and proclaimed his loyalty, to which Edward accepted. However, Warwick was refusing summonses to court, and it appeared that tensions were continuously rising. Edward was actually able to convince Warwick to return to court and received him honorably for a short time, but Warwick's continued insistence on a pro-French alliance meant that matters were certainly not settled. Edward then announced that he intended to lead an army to France, a quite popular endeavor in that time in England. He was granted a tax, and the marriage of Edward's sister, Margaret, to Charles the Bold took place shortly thereafter. Preparations began, but in 1468, Louis XI supported another invasion under Jasper Tudor, which took place but accomplished little, with Jasper being put to flight again. But Louis XI continued to menace Edward's plans. He was able to undermine Edward's alliances and came to terms with the Duke of Brittany. Charles the Bold was also hesitant to engage the French at this time and signed a treaty with Louis at Peron. But an English fleet still made its way to France, which stalled and returned to England. By now, heavy taxation had taken its toll on the commons, and many felt that Edward had not delivered in his initial promises to restore justice and order to the kingdom. Discontent began to grow, and a thin shimmer of hope emerged for the Lancastrian sympathizers. Finally, in 1469, the powerful Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, made his move against Edward. Edward set out on a pilgrimage in June, along with his youngest brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester. But on this pilgrimage, Edward was notified of an uprising in Yorkshire, and decided to deal with these issues himself. Edward gave little thought to the uprising, and set out to deal with the issues, but he did not realize that this was part of a much grander scheme. En route, he learned of Warwick and his own brother, George, Duke of Clarence's intentions to go through with the marriage that Edward had previously vetoed, where George was to be married to Warwick's daughter. Warwick and George traveled to Calais, and the marriage was conducted by Warwick's brother. More seriously, Edward received news that the disturbance in Yorkshire was not a small uprising as he had believed. An army comprised of many of Warwick's men, which greatly outnumbered Edward's forces, were marching south towards him. Warwick and George Duke of Clarence now openly declared that they were opposed to Edward's evil counselors, the Queen's father, Richard Woodville, being included. Their subsequent landing bore striking resemblance to the landing that Edward and the Nevilles had orchestrated years prior against Henry VI. They landed, gathered support from Kentish recruits, and traveled to London. Edward was said to have been unusually indecisive and sent some of his forces to confront the northern rebels. They were defeated at the Battle of Edgecote, with Queen Elizabeth's father, Richard Woodville, and one of her brothers being executed. Edward was then taken into custody. Although Edward may have developed some complacency after his victories, he was a far cry from the feeble-minded Henry VI, and would not be used as a puppet as Henry was. The first rumors of Edward's illegitimacy began to circulate around this time, and was perhaps intended to allow George, Duke of Clarence, to take the throne himself. Unfortunately for Warwick and George, Duke of Clarence, they were not able to exert control without royal authority, and uprisings in the north forced the pair to release Edward from his captivity, with agreements that Warwick would return to his prior level of importance in Edward's circle. Edward retook control of the kingdom and marched to London, but soon it emerged that Warwick and George, Duke of Clarence, were plotting again and were behind an uprising in March 1470. Edward, decisive this time around, dealt with the uprising and immediately set out to confront Warwick and his brother. Warwick and George attempted to flee to Calais, but Warwick's lieutenant there had switched sides and denied them access. Thus, the two were forced to flee to France, where they were granted refuge by Louis XI. Edward seemingly had defeated the once so powerful Earl of Warwick and his traitorous brother, but he could not have possibly foreseen the incredible turn of events that were soon to take place in the near future. Although Warwick and George Duke of Clarence were offered asylum in France, it was not without cost. Louis demanded that Warwick reconcile with his cousin, Queen Margaret of Anjou, wife of the deposed and imprisoned King Henry VI. 
This stood to benefit George, Duke of Clarence very little, and this would become a major factor in time. Warwick submitted to Queen Margaret for her forgiveness, to which she granted him, and it was agreed that Henry VI and Queen Margaret's son, the now 17-year-old and eager Edward of Westminster, was to be married to one of Warwick's daughters. Thus, Warwick had now fully embraced the Lancastrian cause. In addition, Warwick agreed to assist Louis XI against Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, when he was able. Warwick made preparations, and on September 9, 1470, after Edward had traveled north yet again to deal with an uprising, he and George, Duke of Clarence, set out for England, landing in Devon. Jasper Tudor assisted by traveling to Wales. Warwick traveled to Coventry and had gathered a substantial force along the way, but among Edward's allies was Warwick's brother, a man named John Neville. Edward continued to place his full trust in Warwick's brother, who had raised a substantial force in Edward's name. But this was to be a crucial mistake on Edward's part, for when push came to shove, Warwick's brother resolved to support him instead of Edward. Edward realizing that this time, if he were captured, he would not be spared, traveled with a small following, crossed the wash, and began his flight into exile. Shortly thereafter, Warwick rode to London and freed Henry VI from his captivity, who resumed his kingship as a puppet. Edward's queen, Elizabeth, was heavily pregnant, and she fled to Westminster. Although she gave birth to a son, Warwick took no action against her, and in fact sent attendants to assist her in her labor. Edward intended to seek shelter with his brother-in-law, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, but his ships were blown off course, and he was forced to land in the Netherlands. Edward was not invited to Charles the Bold's court until January 1471, as Charles the Bold was still mindful of his alliances with the Lancastrians, of which Edmund Beaufort was most prominently featured in his court. It is believed that Charles saw little hope for Edward after his flight to the continent, but in December, Louis XI repudiated the Treaty of Peron between France and Burgundy and declared all Charles's French lands as forfeited. With this, Charles the Bold agreed to provide aid to Edward for his attempts to retake the throne of England. Edward contacted many of his allies in England and even began talks with his traitorous brother, George, Duke of Clarence. In March 1471, Edward embarked back to England with a small force, including his younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, landing in Yorkshire. He initially found it difficult to find support, with York refusing him entry to the city. But Warwick did not attack Edward at this vulnerable state, and eventually, Edward was able to charm many into supporting him, with his forces becoming quite substantial over time. Edward attempted to confront Warwick at Coventry, but Warwick, possibly out of caution, refused to leave the city. Now it was revealed that George, Duke of Clarence, who stood to gain little from the Lancastrian resurgence, had defected back to his brother's side, although it is believed that George waited for some time before officially committing to this. The brothers moved to confront Warwick again, who again refused to engage. Therefore, Edward moved south, towards London, with Warwick finally leaving his position in pursuit. Some in London attempted to gain support for Henry VI, parading him through the streets, but this ended up having the opposite effect and little support was given to the weak-minded king. Lancastrian leaders, which included Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, now back in England, abandoned Henry VI in order to meet up with Queen Margaret of Anjou and Prince Edward of Westminster, who were to be landing soon in the south. On April 11th, Edward retook control of London and Henry VI, who was placed back in the tower, never to leave again. He traveled to Westminster, where he was reunited with his queen Elizabeth, and finally met his new son, also named Edward. But word soon arose that Warwick was approaching London. Edward, in his usual fashion, reacted immediately, and the next day set out towards St. Albans to the north. At dark, he arrived at Barnet and learned that Warwick was camped a short distance away. The next morning, on April 14th, Easter Sunday, the Battle of Barnet took place at dawn in a thick fog. The fighting was chaotic and confusing, and it was said that the Lancastrians were on the verge of victory many times, but in the confusion in the fog, Warwick and his brother were slain and the Yorkists were victorious.
Edward's younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was said to have fought bravely and proved himself in battle that day. The Kingmaker was dead, and surely a certain degree of relief must have been felt in the mind of Edward and the Yorkists. But any relief that was felt would not last long, as soon after, the expected news of Queen Margaret and Prince Edward of Westminster's landing at Weymouth reached Edward. There would yet be more battles to fight, and additional concerning news also reached Edward that Jasper Tudor was gathering troops in Wales, and Lancastrian uprisings were taking place in the north. Edward, in his usual decisive manner, set out to confront the Lancastrian forces yet again. The Lancastrians utilized deception multiple times, hoping to cross the River Severn to escape into Wales as Edward gave pursuit. They initially hoped to cross at Gloucester, but Edward sent word ahead to hold the city against the Lancastrians, and thus they were forced further north to the town of Tewkesbury. To their dismay, they found the river uncrossable in Tewkesbury, and Jasper Tudor was not yet close enough to come to their aid. Edward had caught up with them, and thus the Lancastrians were forced to stand and fight. The Battle of Tewkesbury took place on May 4th, 1471, with Richard, Duke of Gloucester, leading the Yorkist vanguard, and Edward commanding the center. The Yorkists would be victorious, with Prince Edward of Westminster being captured and executed, allegedly begging for mercy from his former ally and brother-in-law, George, Duke of Clarence. Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, and Queen Margaret of Anjou were also captured and Edmund Beaufort was executed by beheading in Tewkesbury. Risings continued to occur, and one in particular, it was believed, was aimed at freeing Henry VI yet again. With the young Edward of Westminster now dead, there remained no need to keep Henry VI alive. Therefore, on May 21st, Edward entered London, and that night, Henry VI was killed in the tower on Edward's orders. Some believe that Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was the perpetrator of the crime, although this has been greatly doubted. Jasper Tudor held out in Wales until September, but surrendered his castle of Pembroke before fleeing into exile. Jasper, however, took with him his young nephew. This young boy was the son of Jasper's brother, Edmund, who had married a young girl named Margaret Beaufort before dying of the plague. Margaret Beaufort was a descendant of John of Gaunt, through the previous dukes and earls of Somerset. This young boy was the nephew of Henry VI, and his name was Henry Tudor. With him, the Lancastrian cause hung by a thread. But for now, Edward was the undisputed king of England. After the death of Warwick, his inheritance was split between Edward's brothers, George, Duke of Clarence, and Richard, Duke of Gloucester, after Richard married Warwick's daughter Anne, the widow of the killed Edward of Westminster. This brought much tension between the two brothers, and the partitioning itself was not particularly in line with custom. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, had proven himself valiantly in the field, and was to become the major power in the north with the marriage to Warwick's daughter. Edward's second son, Richard, was born in Shrewsbury in August 1473. He and his elder brother, the young Prince Edward, would become infamously associated with the English monarchy in a most unfortunate manner. Crime and the lack of the pursuit of justice was still an issue, but Edward's ability to pursue these issues slowed over time, and sympathies with the killed Henry VI began to grow, as the image of Henry VI as an innocent, pious man began to take shape. Edward once again decided to pursue French interests, not only because it was hoped it would bring unity within England, but also because there was still resentment held towards Louis XI for supporting Warwick's endeavors against him. Between 1471 and 1475, preparations for an invasion of France became paramount. Edward again wished to secure alliances with Brittany and his brother-in-law, Charles the Bold of Burgundy. Edward secured peace with Scotland, and ensured that others on the continent would remain neutral. Taxes were raised, and an army was recruited in 1474, with forces, including Edward, sailing to Calais in June 1475. Unfortunately for Edward, Charles the Bold did not follow through on his end of the agreement. Edward's army moved through Burgundian territory, expecting the Burgundian army to engage at any time, but Charles had actually engaged his troops elsewhere, in Germany, 
and was not able to assist Edward. His other ally, Brittany, also failed to act, and to add to this, a substantial army led by Louis XI was moving towards him. Battle could have taken place, but in the end, Edward decided to open peace negotiations with Louis. In August, the Treaty of Piquigny was sealed, which saw Edward, among other things, attaining a pension from Louis. Edward and his army returned to England, and he continued to push hard to propagandize the situation, attempting to justify the taxation as a, quote, victory without a stroke. Although Edward's time in France did not yield what many had expected or hoped, it did not prevent Edward from being able to rule his kingdom effectively. But it was clear that Edward was no longer the dashing and capable young man that he used to be. By the 1470s, his leisurely lifestyle began to catch up with him, as his health deteriorated and he became overweight. His court remained magnificent, however, and he himself continued to enjoy show, entertainment, and continued to consume to the fullest. Edward continued work on the redevelopment of St. George's Chapel at Windsor. He made preparations for where his body was to be laid in the chapel, as this building was to be his final resting place. In 1476, Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence's wife, died, followed shortly thereafter by Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. Charles had no male heir, and Louis XI immediately took possession of Burgundy. Edward's sister, Margaret, the widow of Charles the Bold, suggested marriage between her stepdaughter and George, Duke of Clarence. Edward vetoed this, as it would have infringed on the treaty signed with Louis. This also would have forced Edward to support George militarily, and there was still distrust that existed between the brothers. Edward did not wish to see George become the Duke of Burgundy, and so proposed one of his wife's brothers for the marriage, which of course outraged George. George then foolishly challenged Edward's authority, and it was allegedly discovered that George had an astrologer cast horoscopes predicting that Edward and both his sons would soon perish. George was also allegedly notified of Edward's potential bigamy, which would have put his marriage and children's legitimacy into question, something that will be discussed shortly. George was arrested and sent to the tower. It was also believed that George was the source of the rumors of Edward's illegitimacy that had circulated previously. After a show trial in 1478, George, Duke of Clarence, was killed, allegedly by being drowned in a butt of wine. Edward now virtually ruled with no opposition, and Richard, Duke of Gloucester's influence in the north began to grow immensely, to which Edward left Richard alone, as Richard was a necessity for him. But Richard did begin to distance himself from court, as did many others after the death of George, Duke of Clarence. Edward and his advisors pushed more and more for the absolute power and unlimited sovereignty over all its subjects, and is something that would be taken up with fervor by future kings. However, in the end, Edward's foreign affairs in regards to France and Burgundy disintegrated, due in part to Edward being distracted by his invasion of Scotland, but also by unforeseen circumstances in Burgundy. After certain events took place in Burgundy, Louis XI was able to ultimately take control of Burgundy, and Edward's pension that was agreed to in the Treaty of Piquigny was halted. Although Edward was displeased with this, there was little he could do. After a parliament in March 1483, Edward became seriously ill, and there has been speculation on what caused this. Some believe that he caught a chill, others believe that he was poisoned, while still others believe that he may have had a stroke brought on by his obesity and lifestyle. Whatever the case, Edward adjusted his will on his deathbed, atoned for his sins, and on April 18, 1483, at 40 years of age, King Edward IV of England died. He was taken to Westminster before being moved to Windsor for his funeral. His two sons, Edward and Richard, were not able to attend their father's funeral. Edward was buried in a vault in St. George's Chapel, to which was still under construction, and it is believed that Edward wished an effigy to be made for him. But this was not to be. Edward's tomb memorial can still be seen at St. George's Chapel at Windsor to this day. Edward's reign took place during one of the more tumultuous times in the history of the English monarchy. Being brought up in the growing tensions that would erupt into the Wars of the Roses, he was destined to become one of the major players in the conflict, and was exceptional in his approach to dealing with this war. He was a brave and tenacious fighter, fearless and aggressive when necessary, but also charming and merciful when appropriate. 
he was forced to overcome multiple obstacles in order to exert his right to the throne. And having defeated all his enemies, he surely can be seen as a successful king and deserves a certain degree of respect in that capacity. But it was not his enemies that would destroy his legacy, but rather those closest to him. Unfortunately, his short-sighted approach to dealing with Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, his actions in relation to his marriage, his promiscuous, leisurely lifestyle of excess, and his inability to prevent faction within his court would lead to devastating consequences for his family. After Edward's death, his young son Edward would be recognized as Edward V of England, and his trusted brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, would be designated as protector of the young king. But soon rumors of Edward's affairs and life of excess came to the forefront. It was allegedly discovered that Edward had been contracted to marry Eleanor Butler discussed previously, and thus the marriage to Queen Elizabeth Woodville could be seen as invalid. This also, more importantly, meant that Edward's children could be seen as illegitimate, and that Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was the true heir to the throne. Richard, whether actually believing this to be true, or simply ruthlessly seizing the opportunity to take advantage of his young 12-year-old nephew, would take control. He shut away Edward's sons in the Tower of London, where they soon disappeared and were never seen again. Richard would take the throne as Richard III of England, and would hold that position until the young exiled Henry Tudor would make good his claim to the throne, returning from exile, defeating and killing Richard at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and becoming King Henry VII of England, thus ending the Yorkist line of kings. Of course, it is impossible to know if things would have been different should Edward have controlled his urges and limited his life of excess. Some believe that if Edward would have lived only a few more years, his sons would have been in a much stronger position to defend their claims against their uncle. But given the ruthless nature of Edward and his Yorkist brothers, and the distance that Richard Duke of Gloucester had put between Edward's court and the Woodvilles later in Edward's reign, perhaps conflict between Edward's sons and Richard was inevitable. Edward's time as king is many times overshadowed by the alleged actions of his younger brother and the unknown fate of his young sons after his death, although what actually happened to the princes and who was ultimately responsible for their disappearance is still disputed to this day. Nevertheless, his time as king saw some of the most remembered events in the history of the English monarchy take place. And whether he is viewed as a hedonistic playboy king, responsible for deposing and killing his pious and innocent predecessor, or as a valiant successful warrior king, whose bravery and aggressive nature brought stability to his kingdom for a short time, he is surely an important and interesting figure to continue to reflect upon and will forever hold an important place in history.